Hey everyone, before we open today's file, please make sure to follow us on Instagram at d.s.radio where you can find all the images that go along with today's case. You can drop us an email at contact.dsradio at gmail.com. You can find all of our socials in the Linktree bio on our Instagram profile, including links to merch. If you're feeling especially generous, you can join our Patreon at patreon.com forward slash dystopian simulation radio, where you can get access to our exclusive Instagram page and make suggestions for upcoming episode topics that you would like us to cover. Speaking of Patreon, thanks to our Patreons, Riff Cult, Cropley Crab, Cash Broadus, Raspberry Jr., Jason R. Nelson, Creepy Paper, Jamie Suit, Michael Laughlin, Lindsay Keller, Mike Wright, Gria Weaver, Kelsey Carithers, Linz Gibbon, Drake Holvig, Only Child, Michael M, Wesley Akers, Riaz K, Emily Medeiros, Pip, Heather Wynn, Graves, Devin Sweatshirt, The Ordained Sinister Minister, and Philip Hoffman. Hi everyone and welcome to Dystopian Simulation Radio. I'm your very sick host, Linz. And I'm your mildly well host, Chris. Great description of yourself every day of the week. <laughs> How's it going, Chris? I'm, I'm good, I'm, I'm good. Uh, no no complaints, everything's all good over this way, but uh, you, you're sounding a little bit under the weather. Yeah, I was trying to cover that up, but I um, my brain's melted. I've been ill for like a week or something and I thought I felt better. Then I exerted myself slightly and my head felt like it was on fire for some reason. So there's that. But other than that, I think, you know, hopefully I'm all right. I'll live to spite God, I guess. <laughs> they sound like symptoms that you should see a doctor about. I see doctors way too much. So I'm just trying to overcome this. <laughs> I'm just Not like, I'll take those a break. kind of doctors. Shut up. <laughs> but yeah, I see those too. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh... You, I believe you, you wanted to say something before we start this episode. For those of you who are listening to this, who are regular listeners, welcome back. But there may be some people who are listening to us for the first time. That's because we've been doing some work with Pod Bible, And we'd love to say uh, just a, firstly, a very big thank you to Stu, Adam, Fran and all the team over there for um, helping us out with everything. We're appearing in the latest magazine in terms of some advertisement that we've got on there. We've also got an online interview that's going up and we're included in the latest Pod Bible podcast as well, which we'd recommend you go and listen to and then just comment all over how much you love Dystopian Simulation Radio. Yay! Sounds like a good plan to me, Chris. So if you're coming here for the first time after reading us, thank you very much. Please make sure that you follow us on whichever podcast platform you're listening to us on. Why not rate us five stars at the same time? Go ham. As well, you should make sure to follow our Instagram, which is at d.s.radio indeed, and that's where you'll be able to see all the images that go along with all of our episodes, and you can also join the party over on our Patreon at patreon.com forward slash dystopian simulation radio. And we hope that you stick around, but regardless, make sure you check out Pod Bible, give them a follow, give them a like, they're a, a great bunch of people, and uh, we're excited to be working with them. Yeah, and tell them that we sent you. <laughs> Definitely. And also, what's really cool is that technically, we can now say, Linz, that we're in the Times. Yes, because there's a digital magazine and also a printed supplement that is going to be put in issues of the Sunday Times, which is awesome. That got me excited. Very much so. Um, I've always wanted to be featured in a magazine for a, a non-crime related report. <laughs> Indeed. So, Chris. Yes. The Isle of Wight. Y yes. <laughs> what do you know about the Isle of Wight, Chris? Oh, Christ. Um, 
So it is an island. Mm -hmm. It is white. <laughs> it, it, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. I didn't know that much about it either. No, it, it's in the British Isles. I'll save you here. Okay. Yep. The Isle of Wight is a county in the English Channel and often described as a mini England oh. with all the best bits condensed down into an island off the coast of Hampshire. Hmm. Now let's zoom in a bit on the old Isle of Wight to the seaside resort of Sandown on the southern coast and rewind back to the 1970s. In February of 1987, the British UFO Research Association, who we will from here on out refer to by the acronym BUFORA, printed volume 6 of their newsletter, the BUFORA Journal. The newsletter, which was more like a Xerox zine in appearance, had a rather strange illustrated cover for a UFO magazine, which Chris is going to describe to us listeners. Oh, fuck. Um... <laughs> I like that reaction. <laughs> <laughs> well, this might feature in that card game that you got me, but I, I know very little about about it, really. Okay, so you're right. It is very zine-like in its appearance. It's black and white, Xerox copy. Um, the bottom bears the name of uh, the Before a Journal, the volume, when it was released in January, February 1978. But what's really interesting is that image in the center, which <laughs> Hmm. Well, I am struggling to know how to uh, explain this, but I will say that it bears the caption ghost or spaceman. <laughs> That's what I'm always asking myself. Yeah, we, we have um, a humanoid being that kind of looks like it might be a robot, potentially, but it also it kind of looks like... Um, you know those test cards the BBCs used to have in the 1970s? Yes. yes. It looks like that the thing that used to be on the test cards there, but it's it's large, it's wearing slacks with no <laughs> shoes. It, it might be holding a coat over its shoulder like a professor might do. And then it has, a, most interestingly, on the ground it has a tape recorder of some description <laughs> with a wired microphone coming from it, which it apparently seems to be doing karaoke into. <laughs> All of this in the background of a lovely quaint English countryside. That is a perfect description. Um, you've left out a lot of details though, Chris. <laughs> well, it's very difficult to describe it, so I would encourage you to go and take a look at the Instagram, but he has a, a, a cone-shaped head um, and from... From the top of the cone, there is a uh, on either side of the top, there is two sort of antennae, antenna emanating from the top. His eyes, for want of a better word, are triangles. His nose is a square. He seems to have some symbols painted on his cheeks, and he has a, a rather, um, in comparison <laughs> to the rest of him, ordinary looking mouth. Ordinary? <laughs> for a blow up doll, maybe. <laughs> yeah, well. He's got some lovely 70s fringing on his on his slacks as well. That's the detail that I was looking for, Chris. There you go. So it's not the conventional cover that you would think you'd see on a UFO-themed magazine, is it? No, uh, I mean, you'd expect, you know, your greys, your lizard people, maybe even a Nordic here or there, but um, what, 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 what would you call this? Well, Chris, the character you've just described is known as Sam... The Sandown Clown. Sam the Sandown Clown. So, okay. So Sandown, that, that's the name of the holiday resort. Yep. It? This is the place where this creature right. was spotted. And and Clown. I mean, he, he now, you, now you say that, he is very... Kind of clownish. Yeah, he's, he's very clownish in his appearance. Although, like a robot clown of some description, but S Sam? We'll get to that, Chris. We will get to that. <laughs> I really hope it's an acronym like satanic uh, armed maniac <laughs> yeah uh so, <laughs> we'll go with that one yeah. better than one i was gonna come up what with. was yours satanic armed mania <laughs> i don't know i was thinking like uh space android martian that's a good one space space android mentalist yeah so this case was suggested quite a while ago by a listener via either our patreon or instagram dms 
I do love suggestions for topics, by the way. So if you're listening to this and there's something you'd like me to cover, DM us on IG or email us. And all the links are in our link tree, which can be found via our IG, d.s.radio. It's, the link is in the profile. So Chris, before I dived into the investigation side of things, I did a preliminary Google search to see if there was enough information out there as a starting point. And there did seem to be various websites and YouTube videos and such. But the more I scrolled through these websites, the more I noticed the lack of sources. So I went back into the newspaper archives and I searched various words and terms that might bring up any articles pertaining to this Sam the Sandown Clown case, and I couldn't find anything. So what I came to discover was the report of Sam the Sandown Clown is only linked to this single report in the Bufora Journal. And it was submitted by a man known only as Mr. Y, who was encouraged to share his story with the writer who eventually wrote the piece. So Chris, if you could please read to the listeners this editor's note that's printed before the story. I'm indebted to Leonard Crump for advising Mr. Y to write to me concerning his own and his daughter's experiences and to Mr. Y himself for providing me with a very complete dossier of events. Of necessity, these have had to be encapsulated. Nevertheless, they make interesting reading. Mr. Y has requested anonymity because of his daughter's involvement. Hmm. So, Chris, this is the only source for this story. And we have this editor's note before it. So let's keep that in mind, listeners, as we dive into the story of Sam the Sandown Clown. Yay! (laughs) So the story starts on Tuesday, October 20th, 1970. Mr. Y was on his way to visit a friend in Ryde and set off from his home in Shanklin at around 7pm and travelled via Seaview. As Mr. Y drove through Braiding, a small village along the route, he took a right turn towards St. Helens and was suddenly met by a huge craft with several lights in a ring encircling it, hovering above a swampy section of the River Yar. He compared the large red spherical lights to cherries, only large and glowing with a hue of white or turquoise light emitting from them. The craft was completely silent. When Mr. Y eventually began to continue driving, the craft moved alongside him, parallel to his vehicle. As he left St. Helens, the craft fell behind, sinking into the distance and hovering above some bushes. Mr. Y was curious, so he slowed to a stop, reached around to grab a torch and began signalling at the craft with it. The craft responded by swinging backwards and forwards without settling. So these lights would stay in the sky for the entire journey there. His friend was even able to come out of his house and ride and see them for himself, as they moved left and right in the air along a tree line in the distance. They eventually disappeared from view. However, Mr. Y claimed that on several occasions after that, he often saw a single red light hanging in the sky, sometimes even following him along silently, as if monitoring him. Wow, okay, so he's driving from one side of the island to meet his friend on the other side, and then he get, there's this massive cherry dessert that appears in the sky, but he, he signals to with uh, a torch. I'm assuming that means like uh, for any American listeners out there, that's a flashlight, not like... A flaming stick. <laughs> <laughs> not like a flaming torch, but yeah, not a flaming stick that you would come to purge a village of a Frankenstein's monster. Uh, and it kind of communicates back with him by swinging back and forth. So it's kind of a third encounter that he has here. Well, it could have been a coincidence, but yeah, it seemed like he flashed his torch and it kind of swung left and right. True, but I mean, it's pretty fucking weird that there's a thing in the sky anyway. <laughs> yeah. So let's go with it. He was responding uh, back and forth of it. And then, you know, it, it just hovers with him for the entire time, so much that there are other witnesses to this. Yeah, it was there for so long that he could actually, like, say to his friend, hey, look at that over there. And it was still up there in the sky, so. That's some very considerate aliens, but ones of very poor comedic timing, because they should have disappeared just as he rang the doorbell. Yeah. <laughs> or, so, like, maybe as soon as you pull out a camera or something, they're like, bye. <laughs> but because you didn't have anything like that, they're just like, ha ha. I'm going to hang around and you're going to have to retell this as an oral history and no one's going to believe you. (laughs) Just wait until you meet our beatboxing robotic clown. (laughs) 
<laughs> so, as if that's not creepy enough already, things escalated. So a couple of years later, on the night of March the 1st, 1972, Mr. Y was driving his car around the Compton Bay area when an unexpected coastal flood or tidal surge happened and he had to exit his car. He was waiting it out on a cliff edge overlooking the sea, where no more than 40 feet away from him, what he described as two bright yellow lights peering up at him, quote, like the eyes of some horrible sea monster, appeared. As the eyes retracted away from just beneath the surface and faded into the ocean black, the tidal surge also calmed and dissipated, allowing Mr. Y to return to his vehicle and drive safely home. I mean, I know a lot of strange things happen in Compton, according to all the Dr. Dre CDs that I own, but I haven't... Um, so, yeah, so he sees these um, these yellow lights. And this is... A, a, how many years later was this? This is a couple of years later. So it's quite a big gap in between his experiences. Yeah. But still, it's, it's, it's enough to maybe feel that one was being monitored or watched and perhaps by signaling to that craft originally perhaps he signaled that he was open for business so to speak <laughs> what chris is this some kind of secret signaling code he i don't might, know about open I mean, for business I, you know he, he might have been like you know waving it back and forth and accidentally you know kind of done in alien morse code <laughs> might have been waving it back and forth and accidentally an alien morse code said probe me <laughs> yeah. come on over <laughs> i am open for business we also have to remember that those red lights, he was seeing them occasionally and they were following him. So I suppose within that two year period, he'd probably seen, you know, these lights following him and he probably did get a bit paranoid. Mm. So believe it or not, Chris, the UK government website actually has a list of UFO sightings over the years. Really? Did you know that? No, I did not. Although I'm very excited to hear this. Yeah, so I just basically did a control F for Isle of Wight. And they didn't have anything far back as the 70s, but from what they did have, I found this quite interesting. So Chris, if you could read these two Isle of Wight related events that I found. 20th of December, 1998, quarter past 11 at night. Vetna slash Isle of Wight, Hampshire. One diamond shaped object with red circles on it. 22nd of December 1998, 8.44. Whitwell slash Isle of Wight, Hampshire. Boomerang-shaped object flew overhead very quickly and then disappeared. Mm. Mm. So the first one I found quite interesting because they said red circles on it. Yeah, that's uh, that fits nicely in with this little uh, picture that we're painting here. So, mm-hmm. yeah, the, those red circles, those red those those cherries that have uh, are yeah. appeared there on the this flying dessert. Now I did find that quite interesting, and I was also very excited to find that the UK government website actually had a database of these things. So I found another entry which is irrelevant to the story, but it's very short and fun. So if you could just read that for us, Chris. Uh, okay, twenty ninth of January two thousand and nine, not given Colchester, Essex. We keep getting flown over by aliens galore. They are dropping germs and we keep getting colds. Please send the RAF or USAF to stop them. I think that's what happened to me. Interesting. Um, Quite possibly dropping germs. We keep getting colds. I I love that they feel that... um, I'm assuming these are police reports. Yeah. Me too. That's what I I gathered. That I was like, yeah. this is these are actual phone calls, aren't they, from the British public over yeah. the years? The, the Colchester police might have the power to call in either the Royal British Air Force or the or the US Air Force. <laughs> and that's no slight on Colchester police, but I don't think they have those powers, Linz. Good old Essex. <laughs> so back to Mister Y. A year later, in March of 1973, Mr. Y's daughter, whom he had told none of this to as she was only seven years old, had a very, very strange encounter of her own. In the Bufora article, Mr. Y's daughter is referred to as Faye, but that's not her real name, but we'll go with it. 
So on the afternoon in early March of 1973, Faye was playing with a friend of hers, a little boy the same age, near Lake Common in Sandown. It was around 4pm when they heard a strange noise, likened to that of an ambulance siren. They were so curious to seek out the source of the noise that they began following the sound. As they crossed through a golf course, the noise got louder, indicating that they were on the right path. They walked in the direction of Sandown Airport, struggled through a hedge, and emerged on the other side at a small meadow clearing with a small stagnant lake when the siren noise abruptly stopped. They and her friend noticed a small brook with a wooden footbridge suspended over it, and as they began to cross, their attention was drawn to... Any guesses, Chris? I'm hoping it's uh, a robotic clown. (laughs) A blue gloved hand. Attached to this blue gloved hand was, well, a strange looking fella. (laughs) (laughs) This creature had a book in its hands and it clumsily dropped it into the brook and flailed around trying to retrieve it from the water. It then moved towards a small windowless metal shed in a, quote, hopping motion with its knees raised high. After watching this creature disappear into the shed, the children began to leave. They got around 45 metres away when the door to the shed opened and the creature reappeared, this time with a microphone and a speaker. The siren-like wailing burst from the speaker, so loud at such a close range that it was jarring and caused Faye's friend to flee in fear. As the kids ran, the siren cut, and through the speaker, they heard a friendly voice ask, Hello? Are you still there? There's so many interesting points there. Firstly, that he had one blue gloved hand, like Mm -hmm. a la Michael Jackson. I think he had two, but one protruded from under the bridge first, and so sort of, then the rest of him emerged. <laughs> sure, sure. Well, we'll see. <laughs> um, and the, but then the, th- the how they describe him as flailing around clumsily and dropping it, and just the the description that we have of this being. He, he seems like a silly bugger. Uh, well, he, yes, he seems like a silly bugger, but he seems like <laughs> a silly bugger who would have been on children's television like like <laughs> yeah. sam the sandown clown sounds like a local television kids tv thing like hey kids it's sam the sandown clown they're kind of des- describing him a la mr blobby like just a oh gosh <laughs> now that's scary <laughs> an oaf that's dropping things falling into rivers and and <laughs> so on and by the way if anybody out there doesn't know who mr blobby is We'll definitely include a picture of Mr. Blobby in the uh, the Instagram <laughs> post that we do. But he is a terrifying children's figure from every single Brit's youth. And you know what? Um, side note, my parents took me to see Mr. Blobby in person. And I'm pretty sure it was at like B&Q or some like weird <laughs> place. And I either cried or he didn't show up. I can't quite remember. <laughs> yeah, like... Hmm. How strange. Anyway, this uh, Sam the Sandown Clown, he sounds like a bit of a character. And and he's got this this ambulance siren that's wailing. But then it's followed up by a nice old voice. A nice friendly voice. Yeah. Hello. Are you still there? (laughs) Yeah, that's what I imagined him to sound like, too. (laughs) Like C-3PO. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) His silly bugger with a nice voice. He's just... I don't know why he's wailing like an ambulance siren. That's scary. I mean, that must have been so loud because they followed it for quite a long time. Hmm. Well, it it leads to the question, what was the purpose of the wailing? Was it to attract something? And has he succeeded in that goal? Well, Chris, before we move any further with the story, we have a description plucked right from the pages of that Bouphorazine. So if you could kindly read this to the listeners for us. He was nearly seven feet tall and had no neck for his head, appeared to be wedged straight onto his shoulders. He wore a yellow pointed hat, which interlocked with the red collar of a green tunic. A round black knob was affixed to the top of his hat and wooden antenna were attached to either side. 
The face had triangular markings for eyes, a brown square of a nose, and motionless yellow lips. Other round markings were on his paper-white cheeks and fringe of red hair that fell onto his forehead. Wooden slats protruded from his sleeves and from below his white trousers. Oh, that explains the fringing. <laughs> what is this description? <laughs> it's not It's not fashion. It's... It, it's wooden slats. What is that? Like, why? <laughs> like, I'm looking back at the image here and I still don't get that wooden slats. Yeah. I, suppose, uh, I don't see slats so, uh, in, the, are they, in the cartoon of him. Are they trying to say that he's like... Right, I'm going to draw a bit of an analogy here. Is he like the T-800 Terminator? Like Arnold Schwarzenegger's version where he's in, he's got an exoskeleton beneath it and they put something on top of it, as opposed to Robert Patrick's T-1000 where he can morph into anything. So <laughs> has he got like a, a structure of bone made out of wooden slats? Is this a really low-fi alien robot? <laughs> I have no clue. Some people have suggested that if it was an alien... That maybe he tried to take, because like children were present, maybe he tried to take on like a friendly persona, but got it really wrong. <laughs> like I'll be a clown oh, yeah. or a robot or something kids like, and then he just comes out as some freak. <laughs> well, it's a pretty poor fucking effort. <laughs> yeah. Well, you can only work with what you've got, you know. If he hadn't been on Earth mm. long, he was probably like, scan the database. <laughs> So, this is just the beginning of the freaking interaction with Sam, oh God. Chris. This is just the beginning, the tip of the iceberg. So, this being began to communicate with the children through writing in big letters in his notebook. He scrolled onto the page and turned the book around to face the children to read out loud as he pointed to each word. Wait, wh- why? He's just been talking to them through a loudspeaker i have no clue chris <laughs> i have no clue okay. <laughs> none of this sorry makes I, sense. sorry i forgot that logic needs to go out of a window with this particular <laughs> yeah. case silly me it's like what do you mean why it's sam <laughs> so the little boy was understandably like freaked out by the whole situation and he didn't really interact with sam however faye read the words out loud and they said hello and I am all colours. Sam. <laughs> okay. What, what's your interpretation of that? Uh, hello. I am And all I am colors, all colours. Sam. Yeah. Uh, I mean, like, the first place I went to is, is he, if, I, if he just read that, you'd think it would be kind of a statement of equality, potentially. Like, like I am all colours. I don't see race. Maybe. I don't know. I don't know. Either that or he's literally just saying, like, I'm patchwork. I'm all colours. I'm a clown. Um, I've, I've got all the colours of a rainbow on me. It's a good guess as any. <laughs> it's not the first thing that I would expect an alien slash robot to say. No. But then again, this entire scenario is quite unexpected. <laughs> yeah. So the words weren't ordered in a straight line like a a regular sentence, as one would expect, which is why he had to point to each one in the order... Like a Ouija board. Yeah, (laughs) kind of. And you might not be far off with that um, assumption there, because the kids kind of had a similar line of thinking. So the kids stepped closer to Sam, who began to communicate with them by speaking. They noticed that his mouth didn't move when he talked, and as a result, his speech came out sounding... As you'd expect, you know, if you try to talk without moving your mouth, words don't really come out properly. So Sam and the children had a conversation where they asked each other questions. So they asked why his clothes were torn, to which he answered that he only had the clothes he was wearing and nothing else to change into. They asked if he was a person because they were confused at how ghostly white his skin was, to which he laughed and answered no. They asked if he was a ghost, to which he answered, well... Not really, but I am in an odd sort of way. And out of guesses, the children asked what he was, if not a man or a ghost, to which he responded, you know. Pretty fucking creepy. Yeah, that's really creepy that he said, you know. Like, I can just imagine him being very kind of like, 
You know, I am Sam. I am many colors. Ha ha ha. What are you, Sam? You know. So he told the children that he was not the only one of his type and that there were other beings like him. He drew a rough portrait of another and showed the kids. He told them that he was afraid of people because he was worried that they would hurt him and if that was to happen, he wouldn't fight back to protect himself. After chatting with Sam, ignoring all the rules of stranger danger, the children accepted the offer to check out his pad. Oh no. They followed the strange being through a flap in the metal shed. Oh no. Let's take a, a look at a sketch of Sam's abode, Chris, so you can describe the listeners of this danger shack that the kids just went, okay, and followed him into. This is such a 1970s thing to do. I feel like kids these days are much more educated not to follow strange robotic clowns into shed flaps. <laughs> Don't go anywhere near a stranger's flaps. Yeah. That's all I'm saying. So there you go, Chris. If you could describe this little drawing of the, the shed, metal shed thing to the listeners. Sure. So it looks like it's made out of corrugated iron. It's seems to be in a bit of disrepair there seems to be black markings all over it so it doesn't look like it's really in use it's got three flaps two of which look like they could be accessible from the ground and the other is on the the second story the only thing that really gives you a scale here is a fence post yeah so if you imagine the average fence that you might encounter in a countryside but i'm going to guess about five to six foot tall so the structure is roughly twice the size of that so you can guess it's about 12 foot tall shack at its peak so the uh, the upper level would be inaccessible by ground to children yeah and it's also kind of obscured from the back by a big trees or bushes or something yeah only one way in one way out stranger Mm. danger (laughs) so once inside sam took off his hat which had been covering thinning brown hair and white ears and did a sort of well Magic trick, I suppose, with a berry. So he put the berry in his ear, put his head down, and the berry reappeared in one of his triangular eyes. He repeated the same motion again, and the berry showed up in his mouth. The editor of the magazine believes this was some kind of procedure to check if the berry was poisonous, which kind of tickled me, because that just seems weird. What? I mean... (laughs) <laughs> of of all of the I am so confused how is that a procedure to check if it's poisoned I don't know I think like I I was like what does he mean by that and then I was thinking like does he think it's like a ro- like an old timey robot like he puts it in his ear and it goes beep 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 beep, beep and then it goes <laughs> out of his hand and goes safe <laughs> this berry is safe for consumption. Edible berry. Yeah. <laughs> That's the only thing I could think of. And I was like, I know the 70s was a long time ago, but I'm pretty sure they had better robots than that in science fiction. Definitely. So, Chris, this metal shed consisted, as you said, of an upper and lower level. The downstairs had bluish green wallpaper with a dial print and was furnished with basic wooden furniture and a space heater. Oh, pun intended there. (laughs) The upstairs floor was made of metal and was a lot smaller. The upstairs floor was made of metal and it was a lot smaller. He told the children that he not only lived in the metal shed, but he had a camp on the mainland. He explained that he lived off a diet of wild berries that he picked from presumably the surrounding area and that he drank water from the river, which he would clean beforehand. This guy, this guy's... I mean, he's an interesting character, isn't he? Yeah. At this point in the story, I'm just kind of still trying to work out what he is. (laughs) Hear me out, Chris. Street performing homeless clown. (laughs) I think that might be the closest thing. I mean, because my my first thought was that he was some kind of robot, an alien robot. (laughs) Yeah. Within the confines of his story. I'm not saying that that's necessarily the truth, but... That is what the story might lead you to believe. But then he's talking about eating and changing clothes and all of these things, which makes you think that he's being. He's just a human being. Yeah. 
That's what I thought. Like, he's literally kind of living in a, what seems to be like a DIY shack made of metal. And he says he has a camp on the mainland and he eats, he lives off the fat of the land in the Isle of Wight. I mean, this is just a drifter. (laughs) It seems like a... A a, a (laughs) drifter. A drifter who plies his his trade as a clown, who for some reason as part of his act sticks wooden slats (laughs) up his shirt. (laughs) So, the kid spent half an hour in this freak's company. (laughs) When they said they please let them get out, okay. (laughs) When they said their goodbyes, they rushed as quickly as they could back to civilization to tell the first person that they met that they had saw and hung out with a ghost. The man they told just laughed. (laughs) Well, I mean, he clearly denied the fact that he was a ghost as well. (laughs) Yeah, but they were like, whatever, he's a ghost. So Faye didn't relay this story to her dad, Mr. Y, until three weeks later at the start of June. He didn't believe her right away and accused her of making it all up. But Faye got frustrated that he didn't believe her. He went on to question Faye's friend about it, and the boy wasn't exactly forthcoming with information, but eventually did admit that it had happened. So, what's Mr. Y's opinion on this, Chris? I get the impression that Faye was somehow taken into a bubble of alien reality created by this strange person. He also told them he had just made the hut. Also, Faye told me that while they were talking to this ghost... Two workmen nearby were repairing a post. They paid no attention to the weird charade, as though they could not see it. Okay. Right. I mean, it's something, isn't it, if your dad, who has been pursued by UFOs for the last uh, X amount of years of his life, is going, fuck off, that didn't happen. (laughs) Yeah, he's like, bullshit, that's stupid. It's like, shut up, red glowing orb man. (laughs) You're just jealous, dad. You don't understand me and my clown-based robot friends. (laughs) But to be honest, like, this Mr. Y has obviously told all of these stories together as if he does believe that they're connected Mm. in some way. That he he thinks it's some kind of alien and that it's connected to the sightings that he's seen over the years. Yeah, I mean, this is quite unique i mean compared to all of the other alien cases that we've covered you can find those in our archives there's the the stinky starfish episode there is bob's balls (laughs) there's the uh, ilkley moore alien these all deal with compared to this far more traditional alien sightings i mean this this guy this thing it's really difficult to classify it and it's it's a it seems like a very childlike story we met a clown yeah and then he was a robot i mean i don't know all of these elements <laughs> seem very very bizarre together a question for you though yes how how old was they seven. seven the two children were both seven which is very young to be on your own going through golf courses and meadows and swamps and it was, but it was the 70s. It was fine. They hadn't found out Jimmy Savile yet. But yes, it is very young and, you know, young children do have active imaginations. And I don't, I, I want to believe that is the purpose of this show. I want to believe, I, I want to know, and I, I, I want to find out more about these things. But this case, it's just, if you've got categories of, of UFO and alien encounters, this one goes firmly in the what the fuck pile. <laughs> Yes, and also, I have seen him on some, like, cryptid website, so I think some people believe he could be some kind of cryptid. Also, he had three toes on his bare feet and three toes on his hands, which is very strange. Yeah, so, I mean, it definitely (laughs) seems like he would fall more in a cryptid or... uh, Karaoke cryptid. Karaoke cryptid (laughs) type of category. He... He's also kind of scarecrowish. That is, you know who he seems like, in all honesty? Wurzel Gummidge on acid. <laughs> Wurzel Gummidge, yes, he seems like John Pertwee's <laughs> Wurzel Gummidge. Like, and that must have been on TV then. This sounds like very... Actually, let me have a quick Google of Wurzel Gummidge, because I wonder if he had that hat on and stuff. 
He did, didn't he? He had like a pointy hat. Our first episode, 25th of February, 1979. Oh, Wurzel Gummidge. Well, maybe Wurzel Gummidge was inspired by Sam the Sandown Club. Gosh, Wurzel Gummidge is terrifying. Oh, did you ever see the, you know, they rebooted Wurzel Gummidge? God, no. I I think I was scared of it as a kid. If you were scared, if you were scared of the original one, fucking hell, look what they did with the, um, the remake. Oh my good God. It looks like the squid from Pirates of the Caribbean. I know. What the fuck were they doing? Jesus Christ. It looks like Freddy Krueger on a day off. I'm just perplexed. I'm, I'm absolutely perplexed by this. This is unlike anything that we've ever investigated, I've ever read about, I've ever seen. It's It seems to have elements of... Like, he seems more like a cryptid, like as in a troll that lives under a bridge. Like... No. Yes, it came from under the damn bridge. Like, if that's not a children's story, I don't know what is. I mean, I would be inclined to say in, in this particular instance that this is fantasy by the children. But mm-hmm. it is very interesting in itself. I think all of the things surrounding it. So the fact that the father felt that he was being monitored by UFOs, that he had these encounters, adds all kinds of validity to this otherwise unbelievable story but the fact that the ufo magazine decided to print it i mean they must have thought there was something to it but i i think i might have been a bit of a harsher editor than them yeah i mean it's a good story i like the story when i when i read the top when like someone sent us the suggestion of just i just read the title sound the sand down clown i was like oh, this is probably like an American thing. Like, you know, some creepy clown has like jumped out of the bushes somewhere in Ohio mm. when he's done these things. I did not think it would be an alien robot ghost on the Isle of Wight. And I didn't think I'd find a government UFO report reporting a similar craft in the 90s. Yeah. <laughs> just, it's just all very fun. And actually there's, um on YouTube, there's a guy, he has a channel. I think it's called Cool Dudes Walking. So it's just like people walking and rambling. And I think he lives in Sandown and he tries to find the exact spot where he thinks Sam the Sandown Clown oh. appeared. And it's really fun. Like he's so, the guy is really funny. So you've got to watch that video. Like I, I had a laugh watching that. <laughs> he does find a couple of strange things, but we don't know if they're related. <laughs> but it's a very fun video. So check that out if you want to see a guy trying to pinpoint the location. Yeah, that sounds that sounds really interesting and right up my street, actually. I think I will definitely check that out. Yes, and I also have um, a link to the PDF of the volume that the story was originally printed in, in the the Buffon Journal. So we'll link that as well. We'll put that on the Patreon. People can go have a look. So, yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, what do you... What do you think? Uh, just assuming that this is real for a second. Mm-hmm. If you had to put money on it, Linz, what is Sam? I really think he's like a homeless street performing clown who sometimes just goes to the Isle of Wight to chill. (laughs) I don't know. Like he's got what he only has one pair of clothes. They're all tattered. He's eating berries. He's drinking water from the river. He's living in his like DIY shack that Mr. Y said at the end that he just built it or something. He just made the hut. So um, there's that. And there was workmen nearby kind of ignoring him. So maybe they they chatted with him before and they were like, oh, he's just a character, you know, we'll leave him be. But mm. also, speaking of the workmen, don't they usually throw up? Like back in the day, at least. I know in like Asia and, and like, you know, some places in Asia, like construction workers still do this. They build like little temporary lodgings. And maybe like in the UK, maybe in the 70s, 60s or whatever, they might have done the same. You know, like when you travel for a job, you build some kind of workman's accommodation that you can sit in on and off yeah like maybe it was something like that because i don't see like if that's his ufo in disguise it's just a weird kind of thing i feel like it's just a guy who's living kind of on the land the only ufo description i've ever heard of with chintzy wallpaper (laughs) yes 
yeah, he actually had wallpaper and furniture in there and stuff. I think he might be onto something. Yeah. In terms of the temporary lodgings, it did look from the the rather amateurish picture that we were given, mm-hmm. or a sketch that we were given of it, that it would seem rather ramshackle. It would seem like corrugated iron had gone up rather quickly. So it could very well be temporary lodgings, and that could be why. And, you know, I'm unfamiliar with the Isle of Wight, but it may be the case that there are lots of old buildings on farms which were once used for a certain purpose and are now disused and a hobo or an alien clown (laughs) could set up shop in it. That explains the window at the top that you can't access from the ground if it was some kind of farm thing, actually, now you say it. Quite possibly, because you say it was two separate levels, so it may have been a barn. And, you know, up up at the tops just for, you know, storage, things like that. But, uh, yeah, mm. this is just so... It's, this is unlike anything else we can talk about. Because, you know, he's not even acting in a particularly alienish way. He's not <laughs> yeah. either trying to abduct them or, or share his insights into the world or the universe with them and, you know, bring some light upon the earth. He's just chilling out with them. <laughs> yeah, like, he was just, just like, doing some karaoke, some feedback with his yeah. speaker for some so, reason. I don't like, know. <laughs> all right. All right, kids. Shall we just go into my gaff and just have... I'll show you around the place. I'll show you around. <laughs> There's my table. <laughs> <laughs> There's my table made of wood. Uh, yeah. Chair next to it there. That's mine too. Wallpaper. You know. <laughs> So, Linz, the, 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 the million-dollar question, has Sam ever been seen again? No. There's only one sighting of Sam, so far, anyway. One sighting. And this was it. Keep your eyes peeled, <laughs> listeners. He told us that there's more than one of him. Yeah, he said there's others like him. Hmm. Now, if he's Even a... drew one. I'd love to see that notebook. Yeah, if he's a human... <laughs> And he says that. What does that mean? Is, does he mean that there's other like drifters out there? That there's other people who like to cosplay as clowns on the side? Maybe. I mean, it, it could be. Um, I'm honestly thinking street performer, traveling street performer. You know, the white skin, like it's face paint, isn't it? And the yeah. and like him saying that he's like not a ghost, but sort of. It's like you know, maybe when you're not part of society in general anymore, you might kind of feel like that. Yeah. But that whole, you know, thing. You know, you know what I am. <laughs> I'm just one of those guys who juggles in the streets and stuff. You know what I am, kids. <laughs> because, you know, um, <laughs> you know, I'm a clown. You know. Can't you tell? <laughs> now get in here and keep your mouth shut. Oh, no. <laughs> I, I'm just, like I said, I am just perplexed at all of this. W- what it, it is, it's. I can sort of equate it to the story of the the young girls who swore that there was fairies living at the bottom of the garden. Yeah, some people do um, liken this character to a fairy or something and and say that's why the the workman didn't see it. And, you know, yeah, people do compare it to that. Of course, those girls, you know, swore for years that it was real. And then on their... So later part of life, they, they admitted that actually they're just fake for photographs and they're double exposed for pictures and things. But the, and everyone was like, oh, I, I can't no believe way. this incredibly <laughs> fake looking photograph was a fake. But there was no further follow up. You couldn't find anything else from Mr. Y or Faye or anybody. Nope, nope, nothing at all. I mean, it was all anonymous, but there is a website for Bufora and they have a phone number. So I'm going to call them tomorrow and I'm going to add in the phone call that I have on this episode. So do you think that (laughs) if I find more, it'll be in the phone call, Chris. Do do they just have like a, like a, a, like a hotline that you can just call and be like, hello, I need information or I've seen a UFO. (laughs) I think so. They have a phone number on their page and I'm going to call it and I'm going to find out. (laughs) Maybe you can call it too, Chris, you know, if we start um, putting a volume of calls in about Sam, maybe they could uh, (laughs) dig, dig a little bit. You never know. (laughs) 
number is charged at a premium rate, including an access charge. Check costs with the organization you're calling and your price guide for the access charge. Oh my god. To avoid being charged, hang up now. Hello. Hi, is this the Bufora line? Yes. Hi, I was just doing some research on a story in one of your older volumes, and I was wondering if I could ask you a couple of questions. Uh, who's calling? Uh, my name's Lindsay, and I'm just um, looking for more information on the Sam the Sandown Clown case from the Isle of Wight. Oh. On which case, sorry? Sam the Sandown Clown. It's, um... Oh, right. Yeah. Okay. I, can't, <laughs> I can't give you any more than what you've read if you've read in our case report. Ah, uh, okay. I, I, are, you with a, are, you, are you with a newspaper or something? No, I'm actually with the podcast. <laughs> oh, right, okay. No, I'm sorry, I really can't help any further with that. I mean, we have, we have what there is, whatever there is in the report. Okay. Ah, okay. Well, thank you so much. So there's never, no one's ever contacted about, like, seeing a similar thing before, like, ever since. Uh, well, you know, it was quite, a, what year was that again? I think it was, the. I think the article came out in 78, but it might have been around 73. Yeah, I mean, it was an awfully long time yeah. ago. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, nothing that I know of. I mean, I'm, you know... Um, National Investigations, um, Heather Dixon, um, and not to my knowledge, and, and I mean, 50 years have passed, so yeah. <laughs> it, would, it would be, yeah, I'm sorry, to be, I have had some, something from someone, I don't know if it was you, uh, in inquiries, before inquiries about further information, and I think we, we got back in touch, was that you, or was that someone else? I think that was someone else. This is like the first okay. time I've ever um, contacted. But um... oh, okay, okay. <laughs> I'm, I'm really sorry. I can't be of help. But I'm sure you can understand. You know, this is a long, long time ago. Yeah, of course. So, I was just wondering if there had been like anything ever since. But um, so no one's ever reported anything like that again since. Oh, I have. I, I don't know. I mean, I'd have to look through. You can look through all our magazines online. You know, do some research. Yeah. Um, okay. You're doing the podcast. Podcast. We have. I mean, we've been around since 1964, and there's a lot of. Uh, our magazines and things online which you can do yourself we have everything there okay so if you want to have a look and see if you can find anything fine but i mean we're a voluntary organization so uh with respect i'm not prepared to do that because we're busy oh yeah of course <laughs> yeah, yeah, if you're doing a podcast i'd have to ask you to do that yourself yeah um, no worries i did find the um the the full report website, yeah you're looking for something similar uh, that that would be the way you would find it. Okay? Yeah, sure. Thank you so much for your time. You're very welcome. Take care. Bye bye. You too. Bye. <laughs> well, I mean, that's left me with more questions than answers, to be honest. But <laughs> thank you very much for presenting this unique case. I'm definitely going to go and research this a little bit more. After this, see if I can find some juicy content to uh, to share around with the listeners on our Patreon. Thank you very much for bringing this to my attention. I had very briefly seen Sam in the deck of cards that you got me of cryptids. However, I had not looked too much into it because I definitely felt that it was something we'd look at in the future. And I'm just kind of piecing this together now that I had once heard of Sam before but thank you very much Linz I've enjoyed this episode <laughs> yeah you're welcome and it's a uh, much different to the last true crime episode that I did so I wanted to bring up the mood and do it in the spirit of uh, what DSR is really about <laughs> silly buggers <laughs> well next time uh, in two weeks we are going to be well I'm not going to spoil it for you because we that's what we do here we surprise each other Linz has no idea what I'll present next week I had no idea I was walking into clown-based horror this week but i can share with you that we will be going across the pond to the usa to investigate a case over that way but it will lead us to some unexpected places as well oh i can't wait i always love chris's stories they're always weird shit i would never think of covering <laughs> so yeah looking forward to it chris and 
Thank you, everybody, for listening. Um, hit up our Instagram, d.s.radio. Click our link tree. We have links for everything that you could need there. And yeah, share this with a friend. Rate us five stars. And don't forget as well about our speak pipe, which is in the Instagram bio link, uh, the link tree that we have on there. You can leave us a message. And we are building these up. Uh, for use on a later episode we're asking people to tell us all about uh, any paranormal experiences that they may have had so if uh, if it's not quite enough you can always just email us with a an audio file as well so let us know that's our speak pipe in the instagram bio yep thank you so much everybody wonderful well we'll see you next time take care and let us know if you see any clowns (laughs) bye bye Also, before we completely end the episode, I would like to hand you over to my friend Gustav, who is going to tell you about his band, and we're going to play one of his songs as the outro this time, because you know that at DSR we like to promote friends and listeners' music, so I will hand you over to Gustav. Bye, everyone! Do you like industrial and or thrash metal? <laughs> Boy, you're in for a ride. Mindustry released their debut album, Katastrof Tankar, 2022. It's out on all major streaming platforms under Mindustry. You can also follow me on socials at Mindustry Official. Hail and kill. Stop stealing